right. Good to see you, Garfield Memorial. It's been a minute. Yeah. It's good. Glad to be with you. If you're worshiping with us online, thanks for tuning in. I'm Chip Freed, the lead teaching pastor here. I've been kind of on hiatus for a few weeks, and uh, man, a lot happens in a few weeks. I turned 60. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Six decades around the sun. Um, I went up uh, on a Canadian lake. I spent weeks in my favorite place on earth, which is a land up north. I love it up there. Uh, grew a beard. Well, semblance of a beard. Uh, my son Perry, you know, who has kind of a full beard, he said, Dad, I never saw anybody grow a beard by mail order. <laughs> Yours is like kind of coming in. But this kind of happened. I go up on a Canadian lake fishing, and uh, I had a blessing to spend the time with my three kids and out in a remote wilderness up in northern Quebec. And I always let my hair grow out. I shave my neck because I don't like that feeling. I usually come back. I look like a lumberjack. I kiss my wife, and I shave it off. But this year when I came out, she said, you look kind of handsome. <laughs> you think I'm shaving that off? You must be crazy, Jack. Like, if I'm going to get a handsome cop. So, and then she tells me it's not handsome, I'll, I'll shave it off. But anyhow, my family said, no, keep it on a little while. Um, I found out I'm going to be a grandfather. <laughs> How about that? Man, talk about three weeks to change your life. Um, uh, Perry and Alex, uh, my middle son and his wife, are expecting uh, in January. So uh, they, they spilled the beans to me on Father's Day. I was speechless, and I had to keep it under wraps until my birthday when they felt it was appropriate time to share. And so we shared that uh, on my birthday, and I, I was the best birthday present I could ever gotten. I told Alex she will be able to see the baby on Thursdays and every third weekend. I think that's fair. I just think it's fair. Um, but anyhow, that, that was exciting. Um, came back with a lot of stories. As I said, we were up on a Canadian lake. I think we got a picture of that. Look how beautiful that is in God's creation. Um, it was just me and my, two, my three kids, Tiana, uh, Perry, and Matthew. A um, few things happened. You got to come back with fishing stories, right? So this was kind of a cool story. Perry, he uh, cast one day, and he caught both those fish on the same lure. Like, I've seen fish follow fish, but I've never seen a fish, two fish come in on one lure like that. So that was pretty cool. Um, this was a great story. The next one, Matthew, uh, he hadn't caught any walleye. We were catching lake trout and smallmouth bass and walleye and northern pike. But he hadn't caught any walleye. And it was basically me and Tiana against the boys. It was boat against boat. And we had contests every day. But Matt said, hey, Dad, can I come in your boat one day? I, I got to get a walleye. So I said, you bet. Come on in a boat. So he came in with me. We hit a spot on Devil Lake. How about that? Um, stomp on the devil. Uh, we did. We, we caught a bunch of fish in that lake. But right away, early in the morning, the sun just came up. Man, he hit a fish. I saw it was straight down. I said, this is a walleye. This is good. I set my rod down. I grabbed the net. I knew he wanted a walleye back. He brought up really good walleye. And just as I was dipping the net out of the corner of my eye, I saw a fish hit my rod. And it pulled it out of the boat. And I love that rod and reel, man. That's my favorite combo. And I landed this fish, and I, I wanted to be in a good mood. I got to be a Christian here. I didn't cuss. <laughs> That's my story. Um, I said, Matt, look, a great fish. I said, look, Matt. He said, Dad. I said, yeah, but look, I'm not going to let it ruin my trip. This is a once-in-a-lifetime trip. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. And uh, true story. And I was sitting there, and I was grieving over that rod. 20 minutes later, he caught my rod. What are the chances of that? And he reeled it up, and I grabbed the rod, and guess what? The fish was still on it, and I reeled, it, I reeled that in. I caught that fish twice. <laughs> and then the best, the best story, we had trophies for the biggest fish and the most fish caught. And on the last day, Tiana nails about a 15-pound lake trout, and she caught the biggest fish. So she took that trophy. Oh, stop it. She took that trophy. And then she and I tied for most fish. Um, and it was great. Matt was only one behind. Perry only one behind. We caught so many fish, but she and I tied. So Matthew goes, you know what? You guys got to play a three-hand poker uh, tournament to see who wins. And I thought, yeah, I'm a pretty good poker player. This isn't fair. I'm going to. She cleaned my clock. She wiped me out. So she got both trophies. I'm so proud. The, this was girl power, man. She beat the boys. So we had, we had a lot of fun. Then when we came off the lake after about a week in there in a remote wilderness, we drove down Terry and my soon daughter-in-law to be. I'm going to have another wedding next summer. Um, they came up to Toronto. And so there's Matthew, my youngest, Perry with the beard, the real beard, um, my daughter Tiana. And then these are my two goddaughters. Um, 
They're my Mona Lisa ministry. I met them 30, 30 years ago in my very first church. Um, they were really in, in hard times. Rochelle was a 17, she lied and told uh, a seedy hotel that she was 18, so her and her five brothers and sisters could live in one hotel room. One of the brothers slept in the, in the bathtub. Lamika, my youngest, she was in seventh grade at the time. She was running with a gang. First time she ever spoke to me, she was in handcuffs. These kids came to Christ, and I watched God do such an amazing work in them. They are now both leaders in their respective industries. They are amazing moms, they're amazing spouses, and they are leaders in their church. And they are, they're my pride and joy. And uh, they told mom, they, they called mom and said, hey, dad's not turning 60, we're driving to Toronto. So those two came, a member of our youth group from 30 years ago, and Rochelle's daughter, and we had a ball. Oh, honey, I left those cards. Can you bring those to me? And this is what I got when they all came up there, um, I got all these wonderful cards. All these wonderful cards. Now they had to give me one, you know, hit me between the eye card. And this was it. If, you know, the, I love fishing. This one says, you kick bass. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I mean, it's a bass, you know. And you see the bobber on it and you play this thing and it sings a song and it's to the tune of On Top of Spaghetti. And here are the lyrics, these, these no ungrateful children and God children. There's a lot of fish references. It says, well, chum, you are older. Another year's passed. Your bobbers are sinking. <laughs> what a pain in the bass. There's no use in carping or cursing your soul, S-O-L-E, just cause holy mackerel, you're really old. So uh, that was one I got. But the rest of these cards are filled with notes and words. I had a pastor, um, very young, who told me there are two kind of words in the world. There are words that bless, and there's words that bruise. I'm not going to share with you these words, they're too personal. But let me tell you, when I read through these, I'm a very blessed man. These cards are full of blessings. And it got me to thinking, here, I'll give these back to you if you don't mind. It got me to thinking, um, what kind of words are we speaking? Are we speaking words of blessing? Or are we speaking words that bruise? Because there, there are two kinds of words. And, and you know what, Proverbs, when I was studying this, Proverbs says the, the second most talked about topic in Proverbs after wisdom is language, is words, is how we communicate. You saw how many verses up there uh, Alex read? I could have multiplied that by 100. There's so much in there. But I was thinking when we were driving back from the lake heading down to Toronto to meet Terry and mom and everybody, and I was talking with the kids and we had all those wonderful fishing stories, right? And I said, what were your highlights? You know what each one of them said? When we came back every night, when we cooked dinner, when we sat down and talked to the wee hours of the night, no internet, no phone service, no computers, just looking each other in the eyes and laughing to our sides hurt, and sharing memories. What were they saying? It was the words. And what do I remember? Like those cards, the words. And, and, and we need to understand, I'm gonna to talk to you today about the power of words, the words we all need, and the healing for our words. Because gosh, we need healing for our words. I was laughing when Alex was out there, if you saw it online, and he was getting ready to read the scripture, there was a little kid out in the lobby that screamed. And I said, yeah, I would scream too reading these things, because this is hard stuff. And I fail at it all the time. But we need to, to learn the power of the words, words we need, and the way for our words to be healed. One of my heroes uh, of, in life, people you look up to, is Nelson Mandela. I've always been an admirer of his, how he handled uh, the abuse he suffered under South African apartheid and came forth with such grace and, and became an ambassador for reconciliation. My God, that country could have been in such a terrible state had it not been for him and Bishop Tutu and, the, and Alan Bosek and others that did the Truth and Reconciliation Conferences. And, and preached a word of forgiveness to build up a country. And I remember an interview he had with what was then President Clinton when he was released from Robbins Island after 27 years of imprisonment. Um, Bill Clinton stayed up at night because he, his daughter wanted to see Nelson Mandela released, and I think it was like four in the morning here in the States. 
And, and President Clinton saw President Mandela when he walked out, he had this angry look on his face. And he said to him, he said, you know, I don't know you to be that person, but you look so angry. What was going on? He said, I didn't know the TVs caught that. But he said, yeah, when they released me, I was really, really angry. I thought of everything they took from me. Almost three decades, how my marriage had fallen apart, how my children had grown to be adults and I never was able to be part of it. And he said, I had this seething anger in me. And at that moment, I heard the voice of God. And God said to me, oh, Nelson, after having you as a prisoner for 27 years, don't let them release you only to make you a prisoner again. And this time a prisoner of hate. And so I, I never realized this, but Dr. Mandela, President Mandela, he talked about words. And look what he said. He said, it's never my custom to use words lightly. If 27 years in prison have done anything to us, it was to use the silence of solitude to make us understand how precious words are and how real speech is in its impact on the way people live and die. President Mandela understood the power of words. Did you hear it in here? There's a the power of words to do terrible things and do wonderful things. In fact, that scripture said, uh, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death in life are in the power of the tongue. We're reckless words, it says rash words, I'm sorry, I skipped one, are like sword thrusts. Reckless rash words like sword thrusts, right? They go in, they penetrate, they cut us. They, they wound us in ways, you know, you can pull the sword out, but the wound's still there. And once a word's been uttered, you can't take it back. It's been spoken, it's been said. Now you can be forgiven for it, you can ask for forgiveness, you can, you can seek reconciliation, but that word has gone forth, and just like a sword, if it pulls out and the person doesn't die, they're still scarred. Right. And words have that kind of power. Now when I was raised, you probably were too, I used to hear that saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I heard a mom years ago whose son had committed suicide after being bullied in junior high school, and she quoted that term, and she said, you know what, that's a lie. Words killed my son. And I've said many times, I think the right thing to say is sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can wound me in places sticks and stones can never reach. Words have a power, friend. They have a power to wound. It, 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 you know, rash, reckless criticisms, cutting remarks, they can sour relationships and break it down in ways that can never be healed. I learned this one time, I was preaching at a little country church in central Ohio, I was serving as a superintendent, and it was a church of about 20 people out in the country, and I preach as, you know, the same way whether I'm preaching to 20 or 2,000, I, I love the gospel. And you know, whenever you're preaching, and I do this sometimes here, you know, I catch some of you and you're really locked in, so I kind of like to look at the people who are locked in when I preach. And so I started that day and I turned to the right side, and there was this woman sitting literally in the pew right in the front on the end, and she looked so daggone angry. Like she was like mean. If looks could kill, I was dead. And I hadn't said anything yet. So I decided to preach to the left side. And on the left side, there was a woman that looked a lot like her with the same expression on her face. And so I decided to preach to the center aisle that day. <laughs> so if you wonder if the preacher never turns your way, could be you, I don't know. But I preached on the center aisle, and after I was done preaching, I went to the pastor, and I said to her, I said, man, those, uh, those ladies down the front row, they're really mean. And she said, yeah, and what's worse yet? She said, they're sisters. I said, yeah, she said, you wanna know what's even worse? They live together. And they haven't spoken to one another in over 10 years. Now, I don't know what did that, but I bet your words were a part of it. Words can wound like thorn stress, and words can kill, like we said, death is in the power of the tongue. You know, life for Hebrew, in the Hebrew language was always threefold. It, when, you, when you hear the word life in the Old Testament in Hebrew, it means physical life, it means inner emotional life, and it means communal life. You never separate those, physically, emotionally, communally. And you know what? Words can kill all of those things. Words have caused murder. Words have caused wars. Words have caused suicide. I know that firsthand as a pastor, right? Words can kill us physically. And words can wound us emotionally. You know, label a child some name. 
right, growing up, and you will scar that child for life. Ugly or stupid or runt, right? You kind of, you'll scar that child for life. There was a young man early in middle, uh, I think 1950s in America, and uh, he was in school, and he had these really big ears, and the kids would always make fun of him. They called him Aussie Rabbit. You're a rabbit, Aussie Rabbit. The kid turned into a recluse. He really disengaged from school, and he grew up, and you know who he grew up to be? James Harvey Oswald, who shot John F. Kennedy. <laughs> See, words can wound us in the inside. They can wound us physically, and they can break down community. If the other proverb says, a perverse person spreads strife, which literally means to stirs up dissension, and a whisperer, who literally means one who spreads gossip, separates friends. Words can, that's the negative impact of words. They can break down community. Let's look at this, this verse from the book of James. It's rather long, but I think it's worth looking at. It says, for, James says this way, for all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is mature. And that word means perfect. I flunked that one. Able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. Or look at ships, though they are so large, yet they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of life, and is itself set on fire by hell. You don't think words have power to wound? Read it. And what, is, what do words do? You know, maybe all words do is they, is they embody our feelings, right? They clothe our feelings. So, so if I feel hatred in my heart toward somebody or a group, or I feel prejudice, or I feel bitterness, if I give words to those feelings, I clothe them. And one psychologist once said, you'll say it because you feel it, and then you'll keep feeling it because you say it. So what do we do? Do we just hold our feelings inside? Do we not say anything? No, look at this proverb. The one who conceals their hatred has lying lips. We need to talk, but there's a way to do it in a positive way. There's a way to clothe your feelings in a positive way, right? One of it is you, if you have hatred in your heart, you talk to God about it. That's called confession. Or you talk to a counselor. When my dad died of COVID back in February 2021, I was a mixed bag of emotions. I had all kinds of complicated emotions. And the smartest thing I did was I talked to a counselor in our church, and she put me in touch with a counselor at Case Western. And for one year, I talked to him once a week. To do what? To clothe my feelings. Because if you clothe them, you can manage them. You can talk it out in a healthy way. And see, don't, 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 don't say, well, I just, I just won't speak that much. Or, no, we need your words. People, there's something in pop psychology that really drives me crazy. And pop psychology says this, it never matters what anybody says to you or about you. It only matters what you say about yourself. And that could not be more far from the truth. We need words of blessing. I treasure those words in those cards. I needed those words to, to be encouraged for ministry, right? Do you know what the word encourage means? It means to put courage into people. It gives me courage to continue to, to lift the light of Christ because, because I'm getting words of affirmation, words of blessing, words of encouragement. It's putting courage back into me to stand up against injustice, to speak out against evil in whatever form it, it presents itself because I've been encouraged, courage been put into me. And if you discourage people, you're robbing them of it. And so we need words. That's why it says, it says death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruits. We are all word hungry for blessing friends. My oldest goddaughter, Rochelle, um, when I met her, she was going through such a struggle, she actually um, considered taking her life. And I was this young pastor come into her life, and I said to her, you're an eagle who thinks you're a chicken. And she said, what do you mean? I told her an old Native American parable that they, the Native Americans used to say that a great storm took place in the mountains and an eagle egg rolled down the hill and it wound up on a chicken farm. And the farmer put it in the chicken, you know, a house and, and the eagle was born. The eagle grew up thinking it was a chicken. And it would be out in the field pecking at the, the seeds with the other chicken. And one day a great 
a native leader, a medicine man walked through and he saw this bird and he shouted to him, he said, you are an eagle created by God. Lift open your wings and fly. And the eagle lift open his wings, but the farmer threw some seed on the ground. And the eagle went back to pecking with the other chicken. So that medicine man came back at dark, just before dawn. And he took that eagle and he walked up to the top of the mountain. And as the sun began to shine, he lifted that eagle and said, you are an eagle, a mighty eagle created by God. You need to lift, you open your wings and fly. And the sun pierced that eagle's eye and the wind from the mountains hit upon him and he lifted open his wings and flew. And I wrote that down to Rochelle. I said, God sent me to let you know that you are an eagle who's been raised in a chicken house. But you, when you renew your strength, you will mount up wings like eagles. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint. I didn't know she kept that letter. Her husband read it at her wedding when I walked her down the aisle. And on Father's Day, she posted something to me that just meant the world. And she, it was a quote from Les Brown. Here's what she put on Father's Day. She says, sometimes you need to believe in someone else's belief in you until your belief in yourself kicks in. People need your words. People need your blessing. People need your encouragement. I do, you do, we all do. We are word hungry, okay? And so what are the words we all need? I'm gonna run through five of them just real quick and I'm gonna bring us to the healing of it. I got eight minutes left, I'm gonna use them. First, the words we all need, we need truthful, honest speech rather than deceptiveness. We need reliable witnesses. See, the problem with lying is it breaks down community. It puts up barriers because people do terrible things when they don't know what the truth is, right? We've seen that in our world because they don't have any reliable information to go on. And when people lie pathologically, what happens, they lie so much that they have to convince themselves that the lie is true. So they begin to live in a whole false reality and that creates barriers between people. We need truthful, honest, loving speech, not spinning for our self-gain and not deceptiveness. Secondly, we need kind and gentle speech rather than harshness. What did the Proverbs say? A gentle word turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, what is a gentle word? We think, oh, is it just kind of mamby-pamby and fluff? No, because look at that very last verse that we read. It said a, a soft tongue, which is gentle words, can break bones. You know what one Hebrew scholar said? To break a bone means to break down the most hardened resistance to an idea a person may possess. Gentle words can be challenging words. Gentle words can be instructive words, but their tone and their motivation are so clear, right? There's no harshness. We're not dressing people down. We're not seeking to belittle them. We're speaking to them out of a motivation of love and kindness. So if you want a test of if you're doing this, is what I'm saying to this brother, this sister, this child, this spouse, is it motivated exclusively by love? If it is, it'll be a gentle word. Okay, thirdly, we need wise and apt speech. In our translation, this says fitting speech rather than carelessness, right? It said, uh, the proverb said, a word fitly or aptly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. What does this mean? What is fitting speech? It means the speech is spoken at the right time, sensitive to is this the right time to say this? It's, it's speech is spoken in light of the hearer, how are they going to receive this? How are they going to hear this? It's not careless speech. It's fitting speech. In fact, it says, if you read that translation, it says when we get words like that, it's like a kiss on the lips. You know what I never knew before? That's the only place in the Bible that that term is ever used. Is if there's fitting speech, it's like a kiss on the lips. Now, I had to do some research on this to figure out what it meant. But scholars say what it meant was in that day and age, when people met one another right? Acquaintances, uh, fellow workers, whatever. Um, if they were equals, equal in status, even if it was two men, two women, they would kiss on the lips. If there was a little distinction between them, maybe one's a general and one's a sergeant, they would kiss on the cheek. And if there's big, big distinctions between them, like a king and a peasant, the person would kneel. But when they're meeting as equals, it's a kiss on the lips. 
And, and that's the kind of speech. So my wife and I, we've been together 35 years. Here's how some of our communication goes in the house. She'll say to me, hey, Chip, you know, I, we see we're supposed to do this on this date, and you never told me. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. I know you didn't. I know I did. And you know what I realized when I read this passage? I may have, I may have said it, but I missed her lips. Mm, wow. I missed it. I missed it. I didn't say it in a way that was hearable. I didn't say it in a way that was fitting. I didn't say it at the right time. Friends, this is really, really important, that we be people that speak aptly and fittingly. Okay, fourthly, we need encouraging speech rather than gossip. Gossip tears down community. Encouragement builds up community. And Ephesians says we should do nothing out of a motivation except to build up the body in love. One of my spiritual fathers, he's home in heaven now, was a man named Judge John Howard. It was the first church Terry and I ever served where I met Lamika and Rochelle. Judge was the first African-American judge in Lorraine County. He was the first African-American chair of the Bar Association, and he knew I was wet behind the ears as far as ministry. I'd come out of the corporate uh, arena. First time somebody called me Reverend Freed, I went in the men's room and, and threw up. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. And Judge took me under his wing. And, uh, and he, he loved me. He, this man was, he was such an ambassador. It didn't matter, you could be a congressman like Sherrod Brown at the time or a Greg White, the head of the Republican Party or whoever, and he had time for you. You could be somebody that was off the street and he had time for you. I had breakfast with him almost every day. We would go to mom's kitchen in Elyria and I felt like Judge was like the counselor of the whole community. And any time they would try to honor that man, he spoke so gently, he spoke so lovingly, he spoke with such encouragement. Any time they would honor him, which was numerous times, he would always quote the same poem. He would say, as I walked the streets of town, I saw some builders tearing a building down with a heave and a hoe and a great big yell. They threw their beam and the building fell. I asked the foreman, are these men skilled? The kind of workers you'd hire to build? He said, oh no, common labor is all I need to do this particular kind of deed, for it takes these men a day or two to tear down what it took others years to do. So I asked myself as I went on my way, what part of life will I decide to play? Will I be one who builds the town or be content with the act of tearing down? He was a builder, a bridge builder, and with God, we need that right now in our world. Be ones that speak words that build up. Okay, let me give you the hardest one for me. Because this is killing you, isn't it? Because if you try to do all this by tonight, you're going to say, gosh, I didn't even do it between church and bedtime. <laughs> right? Here's the other one. We need economical speech rather than impulsiveness. Oh, that's so hard for my yellow self. Um, you know, my, my mom used to say, that Freed's, the problem with us is we have diarrhea of the mouth. I've never had an unspoken thought in my life. Just ask the staff. When we're at staff meetings, I'll start talking, and they're just waiting. They're like, we, know, we don't know what he believes yet, but he'll get there. And just be patient. Wait a little while. He'll get to it. And, and I read these words from Proverbs, and this one's killed me. Because what it basically says, it's impossible to do all this if we speak too many words. Right? If the more you speak, the more likely you are to harm people. And watch this, watch this words. This killed me. This is, I'm a guy who talks for a living. It says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. But the prudent are restrained in speech. Even fools who keep silent are considered wise. When they close their lips, they are deemed intelligent. Oh my gosh, that hurts. Right? We're in trouble, folks, aren't we? Be honest. We're in trouble. Right? But we need words. The few times in my life I've received the silent treatment from somebody, you know, I want to talk to them, they just won't talk. The few times I've probably offered it were really, really awful times. We need words, we need speech, but we need help. We need a way to, to heal our words and redeem our words. And how does that happen? I'm picking on Caleb over here. I told him, I listened to his sermon last week, it was amazing. And me and my wife were listening online. And he told a story he told a story about, uh, I think you were on a mission trip. I don't, I'm probably slaughtering the facts, but I never let facts get in the way of a good story. Um, <clears throat> but he was in New Mexico and all these young people and they were kind of lost in the woods and it was dark and they couldn't find their way out and they were like, hold up, you said with each other and where are we stepping? Is it a rock? Is it a river? You know, and going through this. But he, if you were here or you're listening online, he said a couple of the students had gone back early to camp 
And so they were able to get a guide, and the guide came out and got them back on the right path. And they got back. And when Caleb told that story, I turned to my wife on the couch and I said, I know that guide. I've met that guide. The one who said in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we have seen his glory. The glory of a father's only son, full of grace and full of truth. And that guide can come and find us when we are lost in our words and we are lost in our emotions. Or as my daughter will say, Dad, you are lost in your issues. I say, I don't have any issues, that's your issue. And that guide can pull us back on that path, man, and set us right. Here's what Jesus said. Let me, let me close with this. Jesus said it is out of, well, the Proverbs said, the hearts of the wise make the mouths prudent. But Jesus said it this way. He said, it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Now, I hope you know your heart in Hebrew and a heart in Greek meant your controlling agent. It wasn't emotions. It was, it was the controlling identity of who you are. It's what you live for. It's what it, what's gets you value. And Jesus said, it's out of the overflowing of your heart. Whatever's in your heart, that's what's going to speak words. So what's the help we need? We need Pentecost. Do you know when the Holy Spirit came, language was redeemed. Do you remember the story? The Holy Spirit fell and they had tongues as a fire. And Peter, who could not confess Jesus to one person in the middle of the night by a fire, now is out in the city of Jerusalem with thousands of people proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, of hope and of love and of grace and of power and encouraging people. And everybody heard. And it was the reverse of the curse of the Tower of Babel. When the Tower of Babel, what was in people's heart was self uh, grandeur. It was let us build a tower to do what? To make a name for ourselves. And when your heart is filled with that kind of stuff, people can't hear. Language won't work. What's coming out from the inside is not hearable from the outside. But when the Holy Spirit fell and something new got in their hearts, the spirit of Jesus. Jesus said the Holy Spirit does not testify on his own behalf, but speaks only the words that I speak. Jesus got into the center of their heart and the overflowing aspect of his words brought community, brought life, and built his church. And no devil in hell, no gate of hell can ever stand against that. So how do we redeem our hearts? Say, come Holy Spirit. Come Jesus Christ. Be the word made flesh in me. And you'll speak words that bless, not words that bruise. Amen? Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, come. We need your help. Redeem our words. Make us ambassadors of blessings. Let us speak gently. Let us speak honestly. Let us encourage. Let's build up, not tear down. And God, yes, yeah, starting with Mr. Motormouth up here, help us to be a good steward of words and let our words lead people to the word, the only word we need for a hungry heart. That the word that you heard, Lord, when the Holy Spirit came down, you are my beloved son. With you, I'm well pleased. Lord, free us, fill our hearts so we can hear you say to each and every one of us, with you, I'm well pleased. And when we hear that, we won't need to lie anymore. We won't need to gossip anymore. We won't need to slash people with our words anymore because your word will be in us. And that love then for us will become complete. We ask you to do it today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.